Hi, everyone. It's Tamron Hall. I am so thrilled to be with you for just a wonderful opportunity for us as moms, as expected moms or expecting moms uh, to join in a little love hour. That's how I look at this. It's such a pleasure to be participating. Um, I, we call this the juggle is real. So I'm going to be honest with you. The, these are my notes. But what we're going to talk about is from my heart. Um, the USO is phenomenal, but my journey includes a dad who was in the Army for 30 years, nearly 30 years of his life. So for me to have an opportunity to talk with spouses um, of those who are serving for us, it's, it's just a huge honor, but also not very far from me. And you may hear Coco Melon, which we'll talk about whether or not showing a kid a video is the right or wrong thing to do. But I have a one-year-old who is with my mom, not very far from where I'm sitting right now, who's being distracted by Coco Melon so that we can have this conversation. This is a four part series in the motherhood juggle. And our goal really is to connect with one another. The feeling of being alone is sadly not a foreign one. And now more than ever before, so many moms and moms to be feel they're on an island. Um, I know a year ago I felt that way and we weren't in a pandemic and I wasn't far, far away from my family members, as many of you are right now. And so this sense of feeling alone can be overwhelming. Um, it can make you dig even deeper into a dark space. And we don't want you to dwell there. We wanna find the light. We wanna find the path to us feeling the joy of what you're experiencing right now. You know, I say we want to find the light as a big strobe light illuminates my face full of makeup. I just tried to put on my fake lashes to look cute for you, but the reality is the juggle is real. So I couldn't be bothered. We're here to strip it all the way and just have a great conversation together. And you won't hear a lot from me because we have gathered together, I think, some very important voices that you should hear from. I'm going to navigate this with you. We're going to chat. We have a feature here where if you go to the chat there, you can send your questions. If you want to send in video, we'll have that as well. So think of today as a big family, a family that you have access to through this modern technology that trust me, we're all still trying to navigate. Um, to be able to have a support system like this during COVID-19, I think is very, very valuable. I've been a journalist for nearly 30 years and information is power and love is king or queen, as I like to say. And we're gonna have a combination of both of that. Um, we will have moms sharing their stories, their labor stories, what they are feeling. So again, the theme of this is we are a community and you're not alone. So you can type any of your comments, your stories or questions that you have in the Zoom Q&A box. Um, type live at the end if your comment is live. The chat feature is there. I can see what you chat. If you wanna test something out right now, Feel free to test it out and I will do my, there you go. So see, there, I've got, there it is. It says right there, like magic. So think of it basically as that I am in the home with you, except for I am not there to help you as much as, you know, we all need it right now, but we are here to help with conversation. So a little bit later in our Zoom chat, we are so, so, so fortunate to have someone that I respect tremendously. Her name is Nanny Connie. Um, if you've not heard of her, let me tell you, you are in for an ultimate treat. When I had my son, I read her book, The Nanny Connie Way, top to bottom. And it was just, it was like she was in my home. She has, if you know her, she's been in People Magazine. She's been on all of the talk shows and all of the people who want to uh, just dig into her mind on how we can navigate as mom. She uh, was the nanny for Justin Timberlake and Jessica Biel, Emily Blunt, John Krasinski, and, and so many other celebrities. But at her core, at her heart, she is a mom and she is an expert in the field of motherhood and she wants to help everyday people. It doesn't matter if your star is on the walk of fame, you're a star to her because you have navigated this journey. So my son, and I'm gonna humble brag right now, now goes to bed around 7 p.m. He wakes up at 7 a.m. because I followed the Nanny Connie way, even when it was difficult. So she's going to answer some of your questions. And by the way, fun fact, I never even heard of gas drops until I read the Nanny Connie way. And that kept me 
from a lot of sleepless nights as well. So she will join us today. And we also have two birth experts on hand to address any questions or concerns that come up during um, your plan experience or unplanned experience into motherhood. We have Gilly Levinson. She's a former scientist, a certified hypnobirthing childbirth educator, and a birth doula. She's done many amazing things to educate and support families during pregnancy, labor, and birth. Most recently, she launched, and I think this is just fascinating, the hotline for labor and birth support in New York City in April 2020 to provide 24-hour assistance to women during the ever-changing labor and delivery protocols for New York hospitals. Gilly, thank you so much for joining us on this. Um, as I said, I've been thank a journalist. for having me. Absolutely. I've been a journalist for 30 years. I have been a mom for one year. And in the middle of this, pan well, we're in the middle of it now, the beginning of the pandemic, I remember doing my talk show. And one of the first segments we did um, was the story about moms having to go into the labor room alone, that spouses or significant others and parents, no one was being able to go in. And I could not have imagined the fear and the anxiety and just the overall sadness. Honestly, you think you're going to go in there with someone and there you are alone. How would you describe things right now? So things are actually getting a little better. I think that the first steps were a little bit more challenging for everyone involved. The hospitals, the caregivers, the doulas, the support team, of course, the pregnant parents, uh, everyone kind of like needed to get used to this new reality that we are facing today. And it took a little while before all the protocols kind of like settled down and the hospitals now it's a little bit clearer what you're going to have with the different uh, places of birth of choice. You know who's going to support you. Things are settling down and we're just now need to face what we have and work with what we have. Tell me about the hotline. Again, you know, we're in unprecedented waters and unprecedented time. And the fact that you created this hotline for labor and birth support is phenomenal. Why was it so important to get it up so quickly? So the thing was that when everything got so out of uh, control and things changed so fast and so rapidly, uh, I heard the cry of my clients. They didn't know if their doula that they have hired will even be there to support them. They didn't even know if their significant other would be there to support them. And, you know, birth is a very scary thing for many, many expectant uh, moms and suddenly the fear became so much deeper uh, and the anxiety went so much higher and it was kind of like a click where I thought oh my goodness everybody need that support of a professional that would walk with them every step of the way even if we cannot be there uh, in person. And then I just reached out to the doula community in uh, Manhattan and we created that service uh, where we were available on those times where the partner were not there at all. So for those moms who needed to just go alone into the birthing rooms, they had the support from professional um, and could get what they need in real time. What is the number one thing pregnant women need to do right now to help themselves prepare for birth during this time. And as I mentioned, we are being joined by expectant moms from around the world. I mean, this is, you know, it is a unique journey, as I said, for each and every woman. However, there are some things we do have in common here. What is the number one thing we need to know right now, a pregnant mom needs to know right now? I think that the most important thing that I keep on telling to all my clients, uh, you have it within you. You know, we got used to the fact that we can get so much support, but by the end of the day, whether you do have the support or whether you do not, you have it within you, you have that power, you can do it and step into it. And I think that a lot of the uh, pre-birth work that are required is to reset our mindset around the birth experience and start and create more of that confidence and change the birth view, as I call it, or the birth mindset, and make sure that you know uh, 
that you can do it no matter how your journey turned. Yeah, and that is so true. I mean, as we said, this is a multi-part series um, because it is an ever-changing and ever-moving journey, but you can do this and you will do this and the joy you experience will be so real. Um, Gilly, I know you're gonna stay with us. Let me bring in Diana Spaulding. Diana is an editor for a parenting website. Uh, many of you are familiar with Motherly. She is one of the authors of the book, The Motherly Guide to Becoming Mama. She's a midwife, a pediatric nurse, and founder of Gathered Birth, a motherhood wellness center in Pennsylvania. So Diana, let me start. First of all, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is such an honor. It is such an interesting experience, again, to have this community virtually um, and to be together and still feel the intimacy and the sincerity of what so many moms-to-be and moms are experiencing. How can women best focus on the joy of being pregnant right now? Um, and why is that so important? It's not just a catchphrase. This is not us trying to get you pumped up for the experience. <laughs> you know, embracing that joy is, is critical. I love this question so much. Um, and I think that, I think that there's two parts. I think first it's giving yourself the space to feel the disappointments that you do have and being gentle with yourself when those disappointments come up because sometimes we can't move to the joy until we sort of process the harder stuff first so you know allow yourself to have like the anger or the disappointment that it doesn't look like maybe how you always envisioned this time in your life to look and then um i think you know really embracing the story of what's happening right now. When I think about like these babies that are being born during this time and the women who are who are sort of crossing the threshold into motherhood during this time, like I can't even imagine a, a stronger group of people and a more inspiring story. And so lean into that story um, and find joy, you know, like Gilly was saying, find joy in how strong you really are. Um, you know, and in a lot of ways, I think that we're sort of refocusing on um, on the simple, you know, on like, oh, sometimes it's really nice just to have a conversation with a friend. And like, it's really nice to just go for a walk, even if I'm alone. So, you know, <laughs> who knew? Um, so lean into those joys um, and, and also know that it is incredibly possible to have a beautiful pregnancy and birth experience right now, um, even if it feels, again, different than, than what you had originally thought it might look like. I and mean, it will feel different than what you originally thought. I mean, right. that's, this is the adaptation part of the journey. And I'm looking at uh, so many of uh, the wonderful attendees here. I don't like calling you attendees, but our friends, we're all friends. We're not attendees. We have, I see Italy, San Diego, Indiana, Ohio, Los Angeles, Boston, New Jersey, Naples, Italy, not to be mistaken for Naples, Florida, Georgia is in the house. And so we have um, this, this community again, that's being built and discussing this, Diana. I, I'm curious, with so much in, up in the air right now, is there a modified way to look at creating birth plans now? And if so, are there some key things to it? Yeah, absolutely. I would start with talking to your provider, um, just because, because we're coming from so many different just geographic areas. Um, and then, you know, we all have our own medical histories and our own personal histories and stories. Everyone is coming into this experience with different variables. Um, and so make sure that you're getting really good information about um, your specific scenario, the place where you're giving birth. Um, and one of the great places to do that is to, um, is to talk to your provider and get information. Then, um, you know, to the extent that you want to talk to friends and family and read books, like that's all wonderful, of course. But ultimately, the person that you need to listen to is yourself. Yeah. And so, you know, ask opinions of people that you trust and hear good labor stories and all that good stuff. But also don't be afraid to say to people like, okay, thank you. I want to set up some boundaries now and I need to tune into myself. Yeah, well, and, Gilly's nodding to that too, Diana. I, I, forgive me for interrupting, but I, oh, I'm so happy you said that. And as I'm looking at all of the 
uh, other family members joining us here. I, I think I started to do that toward the end of my pregnancy, um, Gilly as well, because I, it's not that I didn't want to hear horror stories. I didn't, that wasn't the case. Cause I just, trust me, I needed to armor up, but I was nearly, I was 49 when I gave birth, 48 when I found out I was pregnant. But at some point I, I just needed to tune out the, the ambiance <laughs> that was around me. Now with that said, we're all isolated right now. And we do want to talk and we do want to listen. So how do you balance this odd time, Diana, of needing to not talk, but also wanting to talk because you feel so alone and trapped in the house in Naples, Italy, maybe by yourself. Yeah, it's so true. And I think we can be really clear about the boundaries that we set. So I think you can call your sister or your best friend or, you know, and you can say, listen, this is how I'm feeling. I really want to connect with someone that I trust. Here are the things that I'm not in a position to hear right now. You know, I don't want to hear a scary birth story right now, but I really want to hear how you handled XYZ situation. Like you can be really clear with what those boundaries are and protect yourself. Um, and I think people will actually appreciate that because people want to help pregnant people, but they don't know how. Um, wow. If you let people know what you need, they'll better be able to assist you and you can kind of protect yourself as well. I think, you know, Gilly, again, going back to, as I hear my son in the background, <laughs> um, you know, right after I gave birth, um, this doctor, we had a little scare with his hearing. It, it turned out okay, but in those first moments, no one wants to hear that something could possibly be wrong. And the doctor said to me, just enjoy him. And now this first year has gone so fast when I tell you, I'm already thinking like, oh my, why didn't I do that? What? I should have taken that picture. Oh, well, how did I, for, uh, you know, I, I'm mourning throwing away his binky because it's almost over. And you know, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it because I was so busy reading like, how soon am I supposed to take this thing from him? It's the strangest things um, on this journey, especially right now in the planning stage that you have to embrace. You know, I, I take my clients through a similar process, but we actually do a process and it's a little similar to what you do, uh, Diana, where I start actually with what it is that you want. You know, there's so much voices around us and so many opinions and you really need to start and uh, dive deep into what it is that is right for you. Because there's no right or wrong way how you birth your baby. There's no right or wrong way how you raise your baby. So it's so important to tap in and listen to yourself. And, and again, I really think that we have all of those answers imprinted within us. And then once you're clear, and, and when, we, when we do that practice, I tell them, let's think that there's no limitations. Right. Like no limitations whatsoever. Uh, how would you look like when you birth your baby? What will you wear? Who will be the people around you? What will be the surrounding, etc.? What will be? What will you hear? What will be the music? Like all of those things that really help the mom to dive deeper. And then once she and we call it like creating your ideal birth. And the same we do when it comes to the motherhood. Right? So that's your ideal vision of what it is that you want. And then start and get the information about what it is that is available for you. What can you have in the birthplace of your choice from the people that are around you, with the current protocols, with the pandemic around us, etc., etc., etc. And then marry the two together and create kind of like, and I don't call it birth plan, by the way, I'm really uh, big on language. I think that plan can be a little bit like stiff for them. I want them to keep their open mind to the fact that things can change. So we call it birth wish list. Oh, so create your birth that. wish list, create your motherhood wish list and prepare yourself with what you want and what is available and create the perfect picture for you. I love that birth wishes. That's beautifully put. I, I like that a lot. Well, our first mom uh, is due October 16th and she and her husband live on a base in Colorado. Veronica is standing by. Veronica, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> hey, so you know what? Happy birth wish. So what do you wish? What do you think? What, what's on your mind? Uh, when, you, when I say the word birth or the 
words, a birth wish, what come to mind? Um, so because I did IVF, um, my birth wish list has been building for a while now. <laughs> I've had a lot of time to think. And for me, birth uh, or building up to giving birth was um, going to water aerobics, um, doing yoga, prenatal yoga, um, and that type of thing. But my birth per se, I, I wanted it to be as unmedicated as possible, um, as natural as possible, um, and include um, hypnobirthing in the process too, doula, midwife, all those type of things, all those hippie things. <laughs> <laughs> so you are expecting a baby boy? Yes. And you, um, as you just mentioned, you went through IVF. How would you describe the journey uh, up until this point? So IVF, going into it, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I, I knew it was going to be difficult. I just didn't know how difficult. Um, also, how expensive it, it was. Because... Um, insurances only cover certain things they don't really cover the process per se um so that part was shocking um because thinking that because we were in the military i thought a little bit more would be covered um so we had to adjust from the very beginning it's a lot of waiting so I think in a way it has prepared me or it prepared me indirectly to COVID because um, you have a date to do your medication or a date to do a test and then they call you and say, hey, your lab work came and it didn't look how we want it. So we're going to have to change it. So it's that constant process of changing and waiting. Yeah. Um, I so, would yeah. IVF, I understand and tell you again. <laughs> Uh, as uh, both Diana and Gilly pointed out, embracing the joy. I have the, the one-year-old not far away, and then behind me somewhere in a drawer are the needles that my husband refuses to throw away because he's like, this is what got us Moses. And I'm like, yes, but it is time to throw them away because we have Moses. So literally, we will be sitting in a room with the baby and all those needles that you couldn't bear to look at somewhere you'll have to make a decision but yeah it is that there are so many surprising things to it especially because to your point and diana to veronica's point with the ivf she's hitting a schedule everything truly in this case you do call it a plan because it is planned out for you um how does a mom deal with the disappointment of the milestones now being taken away in so many ways because of where we are yeah, that part is really tough. Um, you know, and I think part of it is going back to giving yourself permission to grieve for the milestones that you didn't have. Um, I just threw my friend a, um, a virtual baby shower um, and it was lovely. It was great, but it's not the in-person baby shower that we had planned. I had the whole like balloon arch planned in my mind and we didn't get to do that and the whole thing. So it's okay to be sad about those things. Um, but also I think there are so many unique moments to find joy. Um, you know, my, I have three slightly older kids and they've had birthday parades and like, I never, it never would have occurred to me to like have people drive by the house and shout happy birthday instead of doing a birthday party, but it was lovely. Like it was so touching and it was so beautiful. And so I think being open to the idea that um, that beauty can come in in lots of ways that we didn't necessarily envision. Um, and again, remembering that it's part of this story and like the, you know, if you're gonna make a baby book, mine is like still sitting in a corner yet to be made. Might one day I'll put it together. But, uh, <laughs> but the juggle of motherhood, right? But, um, but like this, this gift of this baby book where you're like, this is the mask that I, war when I was in labor with you, like this story that you're creating for them is so powerful. Um, and so leaning into that and remembering um, that there's real beauty in those moments too. Veronica, I know you still have a lot of decisions to make. We talked about um, a doula, um, 
that would require you to wear a mask throughout the labor and delivery? Is that, what, what, tell me about these decisions that you have to make very soon. Yeah, so we found out, we, we took a, a seminar from the hospital um, that we're gonna give birth in. Um, and we found out this week um, that, or last week, that while there's a provider inside the room, so like while my doula is there or my midwife or nurse or whatever, I have to have a mask on. So that means that during the very challenging time of pushing a whole human out of you, I have to have a mask on. It means that during those peak contractions um, in labor, I'm gonna have to have a mask on. So I am still undecided if, hey, am I gonna have a doula with me, which I, I, it's in my very, very lovely wish list, but do I want to have the mask? Because if I have my husband um, and we do cities um, or other things, we don't have to until it's the time to have a midwife. Mm -hmm. So it's challenging because it's the, wish list versus that flexibility. Um, so yes, I'm, I still don't know. <laughs> you have to, do you have a timeline in which you have to decide all of this? Is there a cutoff date? Yes, there is. Um, I have to, by the first week, the end of the first week of August, let them know um, what my decision is because obviously they fill out the dwellers um, so I have to let them know. So if not, they can give like that date to someone else. So you have about two weeks. I just had to look at my calendar because I, I, I still, I use mommy brain as an excuse for everything. So I don't know the date. So it's either COVID that I don't know the date because of or mommy brain because I can't keep up. We do have a comment in from Bethany in Italy. She says, I'm an IVF mom and I wish that people were more open about the challenges that come in with the process. My husband and I felt so alone. It means so much to hear from another mom who's gone through this. Absolutely. That's why, honestly, um, Veronica, I, I did interviews and talked about my journey as openly as I felt comfortable because, again, going back really to this conversation of feeling alone, that's why the hotline was established. So that, people, you know, the idea is that you can pick up the phone and there is someone there that can help you and that can relate to what you're experiencing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to just bring up uh, the option for, I don't know if in your hospital they provide it, but there's also the option to have a virtual doula with you who would not be in, their, in the room in person with you, so you do not need the mask, but you can have the earbuds or um, the uh, FaceTime on your phone and she can be there with you and guide you and help you and hold your hands and also uh, help your partner how to touch you, how to support you. So there are these op option too now as well, which can, we're adjusting ourselves to the new reality and you can uh, reach out and see if you've got someone uh, in your area who might be providing these kind of services. And I, we're reading some of the comments here. Um, if you heard that loud crash, that was my one year old and then my bird responding. The juggle is real. <laughs> um, we have uh, the playlist uh, is a great idea. Um, someone said on, on our chat here, um, you know, they're going so, the chats are going so fast. You're all coming at me. So, so it's like, I'm going all natural. That's what uh, Shauna said, yikes. And the main thing, I'll be using his heating pad for my back and my husband is creating my music playlist to play during the time to keep me distracted. Um, you can go on Spotify. I put my birth playlist on there and we see if you have some songs on there that you might enjoy. There's another from Celio Fishman. She says that, hello from NYC. I have two junior male active duty members in my shop that I oversee. I want to celebrate and normalize that baby shower should apply to male service members too and their spouses, but in a male dominated culture, it's hard to get them on board. Even if I casually ask them, um, I'd be more than happy to throw them one. But to your point, Diana, everything is kind of unconventional these days. We're all finding uh, different ways to celebrate. Uh, I love the virtual backgrounds that you can use now to have a shower. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I stole this idea from my mother's friend. 
she sent out a little list of everyone uh, to everyone to try to have like the same uh, grapes and the same little chocolate cupcake. And so they all had a virtual identical party together with, you know, and whatever you can find. everyone made a cupcake and everyone had the cupcake in front of them. So <laughs> we were still connected. So with a baby shower, maybe you have a little cutout picture of you on there, Veronica, and all your friends hold it up in the virtual <laughs> Zoom party. There are ways to do this. I want to get to our next mom, Shauna. Uh, it's her third pregnancy, and she's due on September 24th. Shauna, are you there? Yes, hi. How are you? How are you? So you're due on the 24th. Uh, how old are your two other children? Uh, so one is 10 months old, and my oldest is 20 one month old. So I'll, I'll have three under two for a month. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to say you had a 21 year old and you only look like you're 20. So I was that startled. <laughs> and now I'm even more startled to know that you have three under the age. So uh, the climactic factor of this unveiling of ages had me going there. All right. So you, um, your first two births didn't go how you planned uh, is everything that I'm reading about you here. Uh, you were on bed rest, correct? For my second one, yes. My, my first one, I um, had ended up having high blood pressure, so they induced me at 37 weeks. Um, and that was an experience I did not plan for. <laughs> um, I wasn't even remotely aware of what happens when you get induced. It was just I went in, um, and thankfully at that time, my husband and my mother could come in and um, they said, your blood pressure is too high. And, and I went, um, I got the Pitocin done and then it ended up taking about three or four days for him to actually come. Oh my God. <laughs> so, wow. so a lot of waiting um, with the induction. Um, and then for my second, my daughter, she, uh, she gave me, the high blood pressure again in the third trimester. And that started around 37 weeks, but they waited. Um, they pushed me a little bit and then they had me go to bed rest hmm. to try to uh, see if I could get a little bit longer. And I ended up, they ended up um, trying to pop my water in the doctor's office. Um, so it would kind of start labor because I said, I don't want Pitocin. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very different kind of cramping. Um, if you haven't used it before, um, it, it hurts, but I mean, everything hurts. So I don't want to scare anyone, <laughs> but, um, so for her, I said, please, like, I, I don't want to go on the Pitocin. Is there anything else we can do? They, um, they scraped me a week earlier, 38 weeks. Um, I was on bed rest, then they tried to pop my water. And then that day that they tried to pop my water, I ended up um, having her. So, and, and they couldn't, they actually weren't successful in popping my water. Um, but the walking around after that um, got her going, so. Well, you've had incredible experiences to say the least. And as Elton John said, you're still standing <laughs> better than you ever did, I'm sure. And you're going at it one more time. So tell me, yeah. um, is there a birth wish at this point? Uh, where do you stand on baby number three and how you're proceeding or how you hope to proceed? Yeah, so for this one, actually, um, it's, it's funny because for the first two, I had this idea, but I always knew it could not go as planned. Um, this one is my last one. And my husband and I, we've had many, many conversations of um, what I need in the room um, versus the wish versus what I want um, because it, it's a little different. So for example, what I need is I need him to not be on his phone <laughs> uh, because believe it or not, for some reason, when you think about you're having this child, you think, okay, you'll go in and all this stuff is happening, you're, but you actually have a lot of time 
where you do. You can go on the phone, you can watch TV, you can call people. Um, so during those two times, my husband was on <laughs> the phone a lot. Uh, he's a gamer, so he liked to game. And this time I said, I, I can't have that. I, I, want, I want to feel you present. I want you there. Um, that's what I need. So though I can't control when it happens or how long we'll be in that room, I at least have a little control over, okay, he'll be there to talk to me. He'll be there. If, if I want to play, we're going to bring cards um, because I want it to really be about us. Whereas the first two were so scary. And um, I had come from a big family. So FaceTiming everybody, everybody was in on that. <laughs> and, and this time it's going to be a little more private, just him and I, in that sense. And um, that's what I need because this is our last one. So I'm hoping yeah. <laughs> I can, uh, I can have that. You, Shauna, you've admitted putting a lot of pressure on this birth because you're planning on it being your last. And so you've gone in clear sighted with some of the things that you want, which makes sense. No fault. You wanted to make it, um, this 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 moment um are you putting too much pressure on yourself i absolutely could be <laughs> um <laughs> probably and probably because uh we've actually uh him and i have discussed it because you know luckily my blood pressure is is good right now i'm 31 weeks but i'm starting to get a little nervous like that you know <sighs> Uh, my blood pressure usually starts escalating around 34 mm. and that's when they start seeing it. So I was like, okay, just, just stay calm. And with everything going on and, you know, COVID, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been trying to keep it low. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to realize that potentially, you know, he might not even, he may be busy when I actually go into labor and I might not see him until right as the baby comes Right, <laughs> so, just because we have two kids and both full-time jobs. Diana, that's how yeah. I can just comment on that because, you know, again, we're talking about birth wishes, birth plans, whatever your preference, but listen, we know that the unknown variable is nature and your body and the baby. I actually I jokingly told the story on my show, but it's, I'm serious. I had a, uh, plan C-section and I went into labor early and I was in denial for hours lying quietly in pain in the bed not wanting to say anything because I thought there's no way this could be happening and my husband said let's call your mom and I said no I don't want to bother her I let's I don't care this is just is nothing finally right behind me I'm walking downstairs and I just fell to the floor I collapsed and I'm like get me in an uber right now my hair was a mess I did not have a beautiful top picked out as I had planned. All of this, I had everything. I ended up going in in the worst looking outfit I think I've owned in 40 years of bad fashion because I thought there's no way. And I have a little video of me looking in the screen saying hi to my baby. And I said, you know, I, I wish I could have combed my hair for you, but it just didn't happen that way. I did not have my mom glam people magazine photo shoot that I planned. I was just mama in pain so <laughs> how do we recognize that as you know shauna has thought about no cell phones and this and, and all of these things that are right to think about that the wild card is nature yeah yeah it's such an important thing to consider um and i like gilly i actually i also don't use the word birth plan um i use birth preferences um for the same reason gilly um <laughs> because i think that it's important to set up what your hopes are from your birth. Um, but then ultimately what I don't ever want is for a woman to look back at her birth and think that somehow she failed. Think that somehow because it went off plan or went off script or didn't happen the way that it was supposed to happen, that she did a bad job. Like a human has come out of your body. Like <laughs> it is, it's amazing. I've been a midwife for 10 years and I'm still like, what happens? <laughs> I don't care how many books you read. Right. I, I don't care. I, I don't even know. And I'm, I, you know, Shauna, you're doing it three times. I'm a 3,000 year old woman, so I'm only going to do this party once. But every time I look at him, I think, my 
God, this, life. I mean, and I, I have a mom who's not far away. I get it. And she reminded me many, many times when I would misbehave. I gave birth to you. Do you understand? You don't have to talk back. But now, you know, Diana, you're just like, you have life. It's life. amazing. It's amazing. Every time I cry every time. And I'm like, am I going to get used to this? I don't think so. I think I'm just not going to get used to it. Um, and so being really gentle with yourself and feeling in awe of yourself, no matter which sort of trajectory your story takes, remembering that it's a story that's going to unfold over a period of time. Um, and I always say that I think it's, for me, and everyone's going to feel differently, for me, it's more, it's not important your birth, how do I say this? The, your, the, your birth experience is not as important as how you experience your birth. And so if, and I love that you've set these needs for yourself, because that means that you are going to experience, no matter how your story unfolds, if your partner, if your husband's able to be there with you, you have communicated that need to him. And so you are going to have what you need regardless of if you're induced, if you end up going to labor spontaneously. And so setting those parameters can give you, I think a fair amount of, um, of control and a sense of control, even as each step kind of unfolds in the way that, um, that nature sort of intends. I love that. And, that, and that's what's so great, Shauna. You, you went through two very frightening and um, difficult births, but the joy on the other side and now you have a different challenge um, but the joy will be on the other side of these as well and so many people on with us right now relate to what you are saying um Gilly, i have a there's a question here from nicole um in colorado and forgive my vision is horrible but she's talking about um natural is possible in birth are there any options that are less available or that have changed because of COVID? For example, she said her friend just gave birth, didn't have the access to the nursery for overnight stays, totally different from her birth a few months earlier. And what about drugs, et cetera, having limited availability? Feel free, both of you, to answer. Have you heard anything that uh, could speak to this question? Uh, what I know from uh, the clients who gave birth lately is that it was mostly changing the protocol. So um, you have less of the human connection in your room. Uh, if before we saw the team coming in and out, students sometimes coming in and out, a lot of support, human support in your room. Nowadays, this is something that they try to eliminate as much as possible. So the nurse just coming in and out as fast as she can. Uh, the doctor or the caregiver, the midwife will be there um, mostly for the like last few minutes or last few hours uh, when you're fully dilated. And they, again, will just come in and out of the room. Uh, there's a limitation with the option of few, mostly for those who plan the more natural births, uh, want to avoid the, uh, the drugs then and planning, uh, moving their body, walking, etc. You have to stay in the limitations of your own room. So if before we could go out into the corridors and walk a little bit longer distances. Uh, nowadays, it's not available. So this is most of the limitations that we see. Uh, there is high suggestion to bring as least possible items as possible. Uh, just bring what you're wearing on yourself, something for the baby, for after. Um, make sure to bring, this is a big one, Make sure to bring with yourself some snacks, uh, not necessarily for you, but for your partner. Uh, because again, they can't go out of the room, buy something to eat and come back uh, into their room. So it's all of those limitations. When it comes to the care itself, uh, if there is a need for drugs or, for, or if you choose painkillers or whatever it is that um, is part of uh, your care, that will be provided. I, at least I did not hear of a situation where uh, a woman needed something and didn't get it. Uh, but again, maybe uh, you, Diana, know uh, to elaborate on that more. 
Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, and I think this, you know, this is a really good opportunity to to speak to your provider um, because every hospital is going to have different protocols, you know, based on where in the world you're located, um, based on what the COVID numbers are in your, you know, geographic area, they may have different policies. So, you know, you can say to them, hey, I was thinking about, you know, nitrous oxide, laughing gas. Is, is that still an option here? Is that not an option? Um, because for some, you know, that just as an example, I know that there was some concern nitrous oxide is given you know you breathe it in and there was some concern about aerosol and could that you know make it more likely that COVID would be transmitted and so if and this is just an example um, but if nitrous oxide was something that was important to you going right to your provider and asking them hey can I still have this can give you a lot of information um, and also I would say you know prepare I, I tell people this always but now especially to um, fill your coping skill toolbox as much as you can. So that is practicing lots and lots of different techniques, even if they kind of annoy you right now, mm -hmm. because you never know. Yeah. Certainly I'm not advocating that you do anything that annoys you <laughs> when you're in labor, but as your story unfolds, you may find that like, oh, I really didn't like the birth ball um, when I was at home, but I actually am really glad I kept at it because I'm really enjoying it now that I'm in labor. Um, so keeping an open mind to those coping skills um, so that you can use them, you know, even if you can't walk in the hallway, okay, but can you walk around in circles in your room or can you dance in your room? It's not going to be as fun as walking in a courtyard, but it still can be really effective. Um, so again, you know, not sort of dismissing any of those coping skills just because the story looks different. Well, Shauna, I cannot wait to hear an update from our USO family once you welcome the last one, according to you. <laughs> the, last <one. laughs> the last one, the last and final, the show closer, the show stop. <laughs> But we wish you nothing but the best on this journey and we're excited for you and your family. Thank you. I do. Um, do you guys have a list of those questions that like the, that you just recommended, for example, um, what we should be asking our provider? Because uh, we've already talked to my provider about what to expect. One person can come in. We have to wear masks, all that stuff. But I didn't even think to bring the snacks because before my husband could go out and could get a sandwich and come back, which he also almost missed the birth of my daughter because of that. <laughs> but um, I didn't even think to ask questions like, are we allowed to leave the room? Oh, wow. Is there a list out there that has um, that broken down maybe uh, just to bring to my provider and say, hey, are these some of the requirements of the facility? Well, I'm told I'm right now we're gonna work on one and they're gonna distribute it to all the attendees. Oh, great. Okay. Ask and you shall receive. There you have it, Shana. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Uh, so, by the way, those questions, again, will be distributed to all of the attendees. Shauna, thank you so much. We're going to go to another mom we have with Kimber. Kimber's due in September. Second baby. Um, are you there, Kimber? I'm here. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. How old is your first child? She's just turned two and a half. Oh, so you're going to have a busy house. Yes, it's already super busy. So I can't even imagine an infant on top of it. <laughs> you and your husband were both in active duty and decided your family life uh, to go into the reserves. Um, how has that decision impacted where you are right now? So we ended up we're in um, Pensacola, Florida, um, because this is where his family's from. So we had to decide. Um, where we were going to kind of make our home base for us because we didn't want to keep traveling or even um, I knew we wanted to have kids and settle down and I didn't want to have to deploy and leave the kids because um, I witnessed a lot of um, other sailors having to do that and I, I kind of saw it from their perspective and I didn't want to have to do that if if I didn't have to um, so we both chose to go reservist so that we could more or less stay home, even though I was recently almost activated because I'm a Navy nurse in the reserves to go to New York. But then when they found out I was pregnant, they told me to stay home <laughs> instead. But just the idea, I mean, if I wasn't pregnant, I, I would probably be in New York right now. So you were in Florida, 
Um, we know the situation right now, um, startling numbers. Nevertheless, life has to continue and the baby will come. How are you managing um, the stress right now? Um, as best as I can, it's hard because I work in a hospital um, where the numbers are increasingly the highest they've been so far. So um, in the back of my mind, I constantly think about, you know, what if, if I was to catch COVID or what if I was to expose my family or what that looks like, especially with being pregnant, they consider us high risk right now. Um, but then I know at the same time, I can just take the standard precautions that everybody else is taking um, and just do my part as far as washing my hands as often as I can. Um, I change my clothes before I come in the house when I get off of work. I don't wear my shoes inside. Um, I am washing with dial antibacterial soap, just taking a little extra precaution and just thinking twice about what I'm touching, who I'm touching, and, and how often, especially with my little one at home. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, your, the, the, your little one at home, you, I know you've described your first birth as being a perfect first birth. Uh, Navy hospital, quick. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is the second, second dose of perfection. But um, it, it, I mean, that has to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> yeah, so that actually makes me um, really nervous for the second one because everything was um, so great for my first one. I, I, I had this, I'm a planner, so I had this birth plan set out. I had a doula. Um, my plan was to labor at home as long as I could, um, which I did. And by the time I got to the hospital, I had my baby in two hours. I got to um, go all natural like I had planned to go. Um, everything went smooth. I was healthy. Baby was healthy. Um, so I'm kind of afraid that it won't be that good this time around. So um, <laughs> I'm just open to the idea of just knowing that you can make a plan. Um, but this baby's going to come when she wants to come and however she wants to come. And I can plan all day long, um, but it's all about her plan. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah. How has your plan been affected um, by, obviously, the, 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 the new numbers that are coming in where you are? So I initially, I, I was going to use a doula again um, because I became really good friends with my first doula. I really enjoyed having her to help me through the um, experience and, and everything that she taught me, it was wonderful. And I think that helped my first birth to be so smooth. Um, so I really wanted her again, but um, the facility I'll be delivering at is actually the one I work at and they're only allowing one person in the room. So that means no doula, no birth photographer, no little two and a half year old coming to meet her sister when she's born. So um, just a lot different this time. And obviously that requires you to balance emotionally um, being in that situation. So self-care, self-mental care, what are you doing? Praying a lot. <laughs> well, <that's obviously laughs> Honestly, I'm that's just a good praying one. a lot. And I'm just saying, you know, God, if, if you're a spiritual person, I, I just know it's in your hands and I just pray for, um, at the end of the day, I just want a healthy delivery and a healthy baby and a healthy mom. And I mean, that's all, that's all that I care about. That, that's, that's not a lot to ask. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's a blessing. And, and we'll be praying for you and all of the expectant moms um, here with us. And, and I do want to remind everyone, you can go in the chat segment. Uh, and if you're live, put live at the bottom of your, of your question. Uh, any of your questions that we can get to, I'm more than happy to run down the list because, you know, as we talk to Kimber here and she is in Florida, many of you are all around the world. We're in it together. Different experiences, absolutely. But nevertheless, we're in it together. Um, someone who helped me a lot um, from her book, and then I was fortunate enough to meet her um, and, and get her phone number and, and bug her when I have my mommy fear questions is Nanny Connie. Um, she is a world-renowned nanny, uh, mom, parent, expert. Uh, she's cared for famous families, but most <laughs> importantly, she just cares for families. And um, Nanny Connie is here with us now. And we've talked a lot about the birth wish or the, the uh, Diana, what did you call? I can't remember what Diana called it, preparing for birth. You talk, uh, Nanny Connie, a lot about once that baby is out, safe, and ready to come home. And a lot of moms are worried about 
postpartum and that plan as well once you get home. You specialize in the first four months. What is your advice? What is the most important time right now after giving birth? What is your advice once you get out of that hospital and you're, you're inside the home? Well, here's my virtual hug to you all because you're so blessed to be parents. And don't sell yourself short because you've made it this far and this is a phenomenal place to be. So don't listen to that peanut gallery. Leave that peanut gallery where you found them. Now, when you get home, shut it down because this is where it all starts. You have to be prepared for being at home and healing and helping your partner to heal with you. You know, and that's important for your mental stability in those first four months because you're gonna trans your body's gonna transition, your mind's gonna transition, you're gonna go through the sweats, you're gonna your breasts are gonna go through all of these uh, different scenarios, and you're gonna go, who are who's in this room with me? Because you're gonna have so many different heads, and it's okay because it took you nine months to get to this part. And it's going to take you a little time to come back to who you were before. So cut the tags out those pants and trying to figure out what size you were and you want to get back to it. Stop all of that. Leave the peanut gallery. Stop all of that. Find the right foods that you need to eat to feed that baby healthy food and get that fat up in that milk. Put the quarantine on the door and get your best movies out. That's what you need to do. Put your feet up. That's the first things you need to do. That's how you start this plan. That's how you start. I have a live question coming in, Nanny County from L Lakin. Lakin, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Um, and again, just thank you for, for this. My question is, my baby is now eight months old, and I want to know your tips and tricks for getting those little guys to sleep through the night, because this is a rough, we're having a rough go at it. <laughs> well, at eight months, they're transitioning. The teeth are starting to come in. And they're very much aware of their surroundings. So it's time for you to take control again. Um, and what you need to do is to move everything to their room. Reading books, putting bedtime. Bedtime routine is so important. Start off the way you want to end up. At 6 o'clock, start dinner. Or 7 o'clock, start dinner. By 7.30, 8 o'clock, they need to be in their bed. There's nothing an eight month old or two year old or a five year old needs to be doing. There's no TV, there's nothing. Read okay. the books, <laughs> read the books, put them in their bed and tell them good night and walk quietly out of the room. So it's a routine, sure. everyone in the house needs to be on board with that routine and follow out with it. To be consistent sure. will help you because an eight month old, a two and a half year old, a 15 year old and a 12 year old all need consistency. So in yes. other words, you're the boss and your children need to pay attention to what you lay out. <laughs> sure. And, and um, it, it works. I followed the name economy. <laughs> and there were hard times and there were people who were saying, why is he going to bed so early? And then, and he sleeps from seven, knock on wood, PM, <laughs> seven AM, knock on wood. So it is the consistency. Yes. I think you had a follow up. Go ahead. I was just going to tell this is to Cameron, and obviously it has nothing to do, uh, it should, with mom motherhood. But I, in my spare time from motherhood, watch Investigation Discovery like nobody's business. And I <laughs> love seeing you on there. When I saw the email, I was like, oh, that's my girl from Investigation Discovery. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I have to talk to her. <laughs> so awesome. I just, I'm a, I'm a fan of yours. So I was just going to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I really appreciate that. That means the world. <laughs> and that's the spirit of what we're doing. We just want it for us to get in this little virtual room and have right. an opportunity to talk and just be real and keep it real and, and really just, be honest about this journey. So I appreciate it so much. Now, don't watch uh, Investigation Discovery with the kids in the room. They'll stay up all night. I'm just saying. Absolutely <laughs> not. We do not do that. And especially being a military family, daddy's always gone, yeah. you know, on missions and whatnot in the Air Force. And so mom has to deal with the, I'm scared. Can I sleep in the bed with you? So that is my. Uh, tough one too, Nanny Connie. I, so I remember being on uh, Good Morning America one morning and George Stephanopoulos said to me, he's like, people are going to tell you not to let them sleep in the bed. Good luck with that. 
I've struggled with that a couple of times as well, Nanny Connie. How do you balance mm -hmm. that? Because you, you are tempted. I mean, like, and then she said she's there by herself. And I, I felt that way when Stephen first went on his first business trip. I wanted Moses in the room with me, even though I right. struggled with that. Exactly. It's, it's really hard because you do want to snuggle in your nest, but you need to snuggle in their nest so that they're comfortable with it. So you need to, if you can, best sit their room up so that you can go to their room. Like put a trundle underneath. If you have a day bed, have a day bed that has a trundle to it. So then they're comfortable and they are very comfortable with their surroundings, you know, because you're gonna have that stage where they, they're gonna see different stuff in the room or this is gonna, but it, the more you stay in that room, the more they, and the more consistent you are with that room, that that comfort level will settle down. And um, I know mom's gonna have to move from her bed for a moment, but to move from your bed to be in their room makes everything okay. And mom, it's okay to sleep on a, a twin bed every now and then. <laughs> Just to get that. <laughs> Thank you, Lakin. I think we have uh, another question coming in, Andy Kind of First time mom, terrified to head to the hospital. What words of wisdom do you have to prepare um, a soon-to-be mom going into labor during COVID? So you're going to overpack your bag. I promise you. You're going to put so much stuff in your bag, you're going to feel like you need the world to come with you. You don't. You, all you need is that baby that's inside of you and yourself, as the other ladies have said. That's the only thing you really need in that delivery room and in that time. So don't be upset with yourself if you don't get to use everything in that suitcase. All right? It's okay. You've done a phenomenal job to get there. Exhale. Exhale. Leave the peanut gallery at your front door because you're going to listen to them until you walk out your door. So leave them at your front door and go have that baby and come back and then share your story with them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Veronica, you're standing by. Um, I think you were talking a lot about the concern that you naturally have regarding postpartum. Yes. Um, so we were, uh, my parents were supposed to come um, for about two months for my postpartum, but there were still um waiting on that because of COVID, they're older right, right um so my concern is like how how to do postpartum because this is my first baby <laughs> um so it's just gonna be the hubby and i and he's active duty um so he only gets about 20 days we're gonna try to stretch it out and mix it to see if we can reach that first month right. but if not i have 20 days of support and Good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best thing that you can do, sweetheart, is to look within your community. Look within the moms that are around you because every, you're not alone in this situation. The pandemic has hit everyone. And, and we don't have a handbook for this. And we're all scared to death because we don't have that handbook. So look within your community and even with talking to your doulas, you know, the people that have, that know you in, in the beginning of this so that they can come in and hold your hand because postpartum is real. It does affect you and it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel sad, but to know that's the reason why you're doing it and to have someone to hold your hand helps you to navigate those waters so that you're not alone sitting on that island. Yeah. So reach out to your doulas and reach out and maybe they can help you find someone on the base or around the base or someone that can help you. And then in the end, you make a time capsule and write notes to your baby and tell your baby how it was and your feelings. And then you can share it later because as I said before, there is no manual for this and you're not alone. There are many mothers who are going to experience the same thing. So a lot of prayer, and a lot of support from the people that are nearby and in your family will get a chance to see you and be safe in that visit. You're gonna make so, me cry, Annie, Connie. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I do wanna hold up for a second because I wanna bring a little joy to this session. Nanny Connie has been so kind now. She's gonna offer three <laughs> free coaching sessions. So please be sure to fill out the survey being distributed by the USO after today's session to be entered
for a chance to win. The USO will be in touch with three moms on how to claim this great opportunity to, it's a gift, but listen, I think we need to, get there. a whole new <laughs> word needs to be created for the advice that Nanny Connie gives to us. So thank you so much, Nanny Connie, for your You're so very welcome. Go, and, and this is just the truth. I tell you, that book helped me in so many ways um, emotionally on this journey. So I encourage y'all and your time to read it and get some advice. Nanny Connie, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I just want to thank you, say thank you to all of the moms um, who were here with us. Thank you to motherhoodmaternity.com. Um, it's a journey. We know that. And we want to continue the conversation. We have two more worldwide Zooms. It's August 10th and September 21st. We're going to talk about feeding and caring for your baby and also caring for yourself to continue the questions about postpartum. In the meantime, you are not alone. You are not isolated on an island where you can't reach us and reach each other. Nothing will keep this communication, this dialogue from ending. Reach out to the support system that you have. If you don't have immediate access, we will help you. This is about joy. This is about the joy of bringing this life into the world and the continuation of it once you're home, um, whether it's alone because your spouse is away working, or whether you have people there with you side by side. In the end, we're gonna get through this together. Thank you, Diana and Gilly, for your wonderful advice. Please again, check out motherhoodmaternity.com, their social page for support and information. That is the key to this journey, the support, the information. The rest of it, I know you've got it. Don't you worry, you've got it. And I can't wait to see all of those cute pictures on Instagram of the new edition. I appreciate the USO. We will see you back August 10th, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.